Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Saturday, April 20th, 2024, and today we are going to be talking about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and the Kennedy family as they make a decision here to endorse Joe Biden as the entirety of RFK's family comes out in support at a rally in favor of the President of the United States, even going so far as to put out a video on social media in which they directly stated that President Biden was the RFK of his generation. Now, this comes at a time in which the Democratic Party has been pulling pretty much all of the stops against RFK Jr. Essentially, here we have seen Democrats very much in a way equally worried, but also pushing away RFK Jr. from their association with the Democratic brand. Now, if you remember, RFK Jr. initially ran for president as a Democrat. He was looking to challenge President Biden, but quickly decided that he was going to drop out of the race as a Democrat and instead run as an independent. He floated for a brief period of time running as a Libertarian Party nominee, but generally had always been more towards the center of it because he had been further uh, disassociated with the Democratic Party after a lot of different things had broken out between him and the National Democrats. And Democrats obviously were not happy that RFK Jr. did decide to run, but in a way they're taking him seriously enough that they are enlisting nearly the entirety of the Kennedy family for this re-election bid. Now this is coming at a time where RFK Jr. has just received calls to drop out of the race from people that are very well acclimated with him. His environmental colleagues have said that he needs to leave the race and in a way, quote, honor our planet and drop out. Now, it's very interesting to see the reaction from this on two sides from the Democratic perspective. On one end, Democrats look at this and say, RFK Jr. is absolutely not going to be a big deal for this election. And then on the other side, we'll address it very publicly, even by implicating the Kennedy family, going so far as to pushing out political ads and even holding a rally with the Kennedy family endorsing Joe Biden for president. And while I do think both things can be equally true, I think we're going to take some time here and actually analyze, and not that I think I know because I'm making the video for you guys, but we're going to take some time here and actually analyze the impact of third-party candidates back in 2016, but also what we might be able to expect for this coming November. Because in this decision here with now the environmental colleagues calling him to drop out, with Democrats really trying to do everything they can to get him out of the race, and now the Kennedy family making it crystal clear that they are endorsing Joe Biden here, I think this is going to start to be when the Democratic Party really pushes again. RFK Jr. And yes, an acknowledgement that his presence has been notable, that his presence has made, you know, certainly a few people worried, but also enough that could potentially end his presidential bid, not to a point where he drops out, but where he fades into political irrelevancy as this becomes more and more of a head-to-head -head race into the coming months for this summer, for this November in specific. Now, what I will tell you is that straight off the bat, the Hill has done a good job at compiling the polls we have seen between President Biden and President Trump. But when Robert F. Kennedy was first in the race and first polled in the races, September 24th was the first day of their political average here, the numbers on the national average. Robert F. Kennedy was at 19% support nationwide. In fact, over the coming months, his lead had been pretty strong, above 10% for months on end. But one thing was clear. President Biden and President Trump's numbers really didn't fluctuate month, much. Maybe they went back and forth, but generally speaking, they were exactly where they are today, 42 to 41. But Robert F. Kennedy, his numbers, we saw dramatically decrease since the time at which he was first polled in September at 19%, where today he's at 7%. And if this trend continues over the next coming months, by election day, RFK Jr. could very well be around 3 to 4% significantly more inconsequential than anyone could have predicted when those initial 19 to 20% numbers had been introduced. And it reminds me a lot of the 2016 presidential election, when people like Gary Johnson at different points in time, like September of 2016, polled at 13 points nationally. In July of 2016, right around the time of the Republican National Convention, you saw Gary Johnson at 13%. NBC News, September of 2016, 12%. IBD, 12%, right? And what we know here is that when the election actually came to be, when push came to shove, Gary Johnson only received 3.28% of the vote because voters recognize closer and closer to the election that it is a two-way you know, system. It is a two-party system, and they have to choose one or the other. 
And while there was certainly an impact of third party votes when it came down to the Electoral College, and whether you could argue that it would have gone for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump is really not what I'm interested here. What I am interested to see here is whether or not the impact of these third party candidates was enough to say that these candidates themselves did in fact change the outcome of the election, because maybe they wouldn't have. But in some of these more competitive states too, I've seen arguments being made that in the same way that these two candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, will fight for the same seven states, Nevada, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and North Carolina, maybe so will RFK. Maybe so will Jill Stein and Cornell West and the candidates that are looking to be the next president of the United States. And while in a way I will say I believe that is true, the numbers don't back up significant increases in third party support just because it's a battleground state. Remember how we just took a, take a look at the national average here? Well, in Michigan, it was nearly spot on. You can see that in the national average in 2016, we can go back to looking at uh, what the results were. I think it actually may, might be right on the money here because the results show that in the national popular vote, it was 3.28%. In Michigan, it was a marginal increase. And when you take a look too, not just here, but when you take a look at other states as well, for instance, in Wisconsin, you didn't really see that much more third-party support, 3.58%, 1.04%. We can look at this too and just find it practically in every battleground state. I find it to be quite interesting that, you know, people looked at this and said that it was unequivocally the impact of third-party candidates that Hillary Clinton lost the election. And while you could totally take it different directions, you could talk about the Democratic primary. You could talk about the lack of support from the Bernie wing of the party. You could talk about the lack of support that Hillary Clinton received compared to the Obama coalition. You could talk about the third party candidates. There are so many different ways you can try to pinpoint blame or reason about why an election went the way it went. But one thing is evident. Gary Johnson and Jill Stein didn't perform significantly better in swing states and in some cases significantly underperformed. And that goes to show that although these candidates might be spending time in these states, they invest a lot in these states. It is very, very rare that they do make an impact. The only places where I think they did in 2016, when this was unequivocally perceived as the election of the lesser of two evils, I think back when it comes down to the state of Utah, when Evan McMullen, as an independent here, received 21.54% of the vote. Or in Colorado, where Gary Johnson received above the national at 5.18%, but more in New Mexico, where he received 9.34%. This made an impact. This did make a difference. Maybe, and I do think this is true, maybe Hillary Clinton still would have won. But pulling away 1 in 10 voters as a third-party candidate is insane. Even 1 in 20 is a lot. Which is why these numbers here do, in fact, worry Democrats. Because any third-party candidate receiving 7% of the vote nationwide is a candidate to be worried about. But clearly, it's not as high as it once was. From 19 down to 7, there is a clear downward decline that should it continue, as I've been saying, should it continue through November, Democrats will be up. Joe Biden will be up. Because RFK Jr., while maybe polling from equal sides, that's not what I'm worried about. What I'm worrying about when I'm looking at this, if I was a Biden strategist, I would look at this and say, I'm more worried that this will look more like a three-way race instead of a two-way race. Because Biden does better when juxtaposed with President Trump, simply because of the fact that Joe Biden is very different than Donald Trump. But RFK Jr., despite all of his scandals, which we'll touch on in just a moment, despite all of his scandals, ideologically doesn't align too differently from national Democrats. He's a liberal on issues besides vaccines. He's a liberal on many, many issues. After all, he is a Kennedy, and voters know that name. They like that name. And that's why at initial glance, even in the very early stages of his exploratory bid, he was receiving support on the very, very bare minimum, the fact that it was his last name. It's interesting, though. When you take a look at numbers in the early stages of the campaign, sometimes they would ask voters, here's a picture of RFK Jr. and RFK. Who is it that you're voting for for this November? And in some polls, nearly 50% of RFK Jr. supporters were picking the old RFK who passed away. Interesting. And I think looking at it too, education is where the Democratic campaign is coming in to really try to do everything they can to stop it. They are really trying to make it a decision 
between Donald Trump and Joe Biden and trying to say that any vote besides for Joe Biden, besides Joe Biden, is for Donald Trump. And so they're going to do this. The whole point of this, too, is education. And when they talk about the 2016 election, because they certainly were asked about it when they were talking about, you know, what they were going to do in relation to the 2016 election, they said their big problem here was the American public really didn't know, wasn't educated on the impact of voting for a third party candidate. What could happen here? And if Democrats are able to message on this correctly, they very well could tank RFK Jr., even as he makes ballot access in states like Michigan, Democrats are probably going to go on full offense here. And they have the money and the means to do so. They have the entire backing of the Kennedy family, who I'm sure this is not the last we will see of them, especially if RFK maintains a national presence. I could very well imagine it going so far as to family internal drama being dug up and weaponized against RFK Jr., because that's the way that this type of politics works. I mean, when Sarah Palin decided that she was going to run for House of Representatives in the state of Alaska, you found that she had uh, one of her former, I believe, her former husband, uh, you know, they decided that that family was going to endorse Nick Begich, the other Republican, and hosted his election night watch party. And while I don't think that had an impact on the way voters went, I do think, though, there could be an impact of having the full Kennedy family laid out here, essentially drawing a huge, huge stark difference between themselves and RFK Jr. Because right now, RFK Jr., in a way, represents the Kennedys. The rest of the Kennedys don't align with him. And so I'd be interested to see if they could position it and weaponize it in a way that makes it seem like he is the outcast, that he is on the outside on this, that this is not a decision that they made consciously, nor one that they support. And I do think that that could be an effective strategy for Democrats. Because while I do think voters are going to very much move this down to a two-party race, to a Donald Trump, Joe Biden rematch. I think that's going to happen undoubtedly. The extent at which it does matters because it could be the difference between winning and losing for President Biden because it needs to be a two-way race now. And so far, it really isn't. While a lot of the media headway and conversation is about that, and while opposition research seems to be dug up more and more about RFK Jr., it still seems to be that there is a presence and an impact of third-party candidates. But I do think RFK Jr. has a bit more controversies and baggage that he needs to confront. That as he becomes more and more of a mainstream candidate, as he gets more and more ballot access, and as Democrats have the means to publicize this more, I believe his numbers and his, in his support will decrease over time. Because it isn't a popular take to promote anti-vaccine rhetoric, at least not for the base that Joe Biden needs. Joe Biden doesn't win his elections on a rhetoric like this one. Democrats don't have that many anti-vaccine voters. Republicans do. On issues like this one, too. I don't even want to, you know, humor it here by reading it off. But you can see exactly the extent of some of the things that could be weaponized against RFK Jr. And while this may already be public information, I can guarantee you the average supporter of RFK Jr. does not know about many of these things. In fact, when I was researching for this video, I was looking into some of these things and I genuinely had to ask, how did he get so far? It might seem similar to Donald Trump, who was able to avoid any and all controversy, in fact, used it to his advantage. But RFK Jr. isn't that. And the moment that you see the conservative base turn on him, a lot of others will too. Because his base right now isn't Democrats, but it still is pulling some. And right now, Democrats need to minimize all, all bleeding from the Biden campaign. Because it is an election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, fundamentally. It is an election and a rematch of the 2020 presidential. And no one can deny that. But Democrats need to position it as such. Because otherwise, they could lose. What we know, too, on the last point here, promise you, is that this election is also about reaching ceilings. Donald Trump has reached his. Despite maintaining a lead for months on end, he was never able to get more than 48% nationwide. Never a majority in the way that Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton had. Not even a majority in the way that Joe Biden had won back in 2020. And this was at one of the lowest points for President Biden we have seen. Even at the time where President Biden was losing by four points nationally, President Trump still couldn't crack more than 47.3%. What does that tell you? That the disgruntled voter here the lack of enthusiasm voter here, the median voter here, 
that voted for Biden in 2020 and is unwilling to in 2024 isn't voting for Trump at default. They are still here in a possibility to vote for Biden, and it could very well happen. And it would be interesting to see that with the removal, potentially, of RFK as a major and prominent candidate in the race, what that would do to this election. Because I honestly think it would help for President Biden, and I think based on who they're pulling out to endorse him, they know that too. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist from 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.